is doing there. All right, this morning it is December the 26th, the day after Christmas. And when I was thinking about kind of as we're wrapping up this message, we've had four weeks, this is the, the fourth week, um, looking at some of these songs of worship, these songs of praise that were reactionary to God's revelation to man. We see that there's a lot of things that, that God was orchestrating uh, behind the scenes when it comes to the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when we say Christmas, that Jesus Christ was born on this day, I hope we all understand that, that we do not know uh, what day Christ was born. We don't know that it was December the 25th. In fact, it most likely was not. Uh, those who, who've looked into this and, and kind of have um, kind of timelines, different things, are thinking usually it's, it's maybe springtime. Uh, maybe you're taking March or April, but there's no way of even for sure uh, knowing that. Uh, it is simply the time that had been set aside uh, for uh, Christmas for the recognition of the birth of Jesus. Um, and it's kind of interesting. I wanted to just kind of review real quick and give you maybe an, a, a new insight into what, what this is as far as why did we decide on the, the 25th or who is it that decided the 25th. Um, there's actually a lot of factors that went into the determination of December 25th for being Christmas. Uh, some of them dealt with the Roman calendar. Others uh, had a more spiritual nature to it. But the actual practice of celebrating Christmas on December 25th, it goes all the way back to the year 336. And so we're going way back, okay? We're going way back uh, to 336 when the Roman Catholic Church first began celebrating Christmas on the date of the 25th. It was during the reign of the Emperor Constantine. Uh, and Constantine had made Christianity the official religion of the empire. Now, the way in which he did that might not have been... Um, the most well represent the, the best representation of the love of Christ okay become Christian or die I mean it's just not usually the best form of evangelism I don't recommend that uh, for you um, that's not what we'd want to do today but that's kind of the route that Constantine took um, declared December the 25th to be uh, the recognition of the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ um, many historians speculate that this date was primarily selected um, as a reaction to the other pagan religions because Constantine wanted to um, create a, a Christian nation, okay, quote-unquote Christian nation, in contrast to the pagan uh, religions. And at this time of the year, this toward the end of December, is when many of the pagan festivals were taking place. And so Constantine, it would have only made sense, would want to try and elevate Christianity above any other type of festival, any other type of pagan uh, ritual, any other type of celebration of other false gods. And so you combine all of these factors, calendars, spiritual nature, wanting to elevate Christianity to a higher status than other quote-unquote religions of the day, then, then that would make a lot of sense. Now, is that, is that exactly 100% why? Nobody really knows for sure, but the history behind it is quite interesting. So whenever Christ was born, uh, Merry Christmas, and we can set it aside on the 25th. I think it's a great thing to do, something set in our calendars that every year we can uh, remember and we can uh, reflect upon what it is that God has done. So a little bit of history lesson today. Um, I figure you probably didn't expect that this morning, but hey, I'm full of surprises. So yeah. All right. Um, the fact of the matter, today we are finishing up this four-part series. Uh, it is the end of the year. It is the right the day after Christmas. Um, and as we have been going through this series, as I've said, we are looking through the lens of worship. We're looking at the four songs that are given, especially here in the Gospel of Luke, that reflect upon the birth of, of Jesus himself. And we've looked at so far three of them. We've looked at the song of Mary, uh, the song of Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist, and the song of the angels. Now, each of these songs are really unique, okay? Uh, if you're looking for commonality amongst them, you're going to find some commonality, but they're very unique in that they express um, the individual nature of the one singing the song. They express what it is that they are experiencing, their reaction to God's revelation, and they are expressing their heart as they call out uh, to God, in very, again, in a very, very unique fashion. Um, each of those songs also reflects a very unique part of the Christmas story, uh, whether it's the, the revelation to Mary from the angel Gabriel, setting forth what is going to happen, telling her that, that his name should be named Jesus, whether it's Zacharias who is given the information also from the angel Gabriel to say to prepare the way for the coming of the Messiah, your son is going to have this very important role. And this is going to be even a miracle in your life and Elizabeth's life. And so we see that, that he is responding to something that only God could have done. 
And then the angels themselves announcing the birth of Jesus, announcing the birth of the one that they have been worshiping, okay, from the very beginning, as Jesus has left heaven, being the second person of the Godhead, coming to this earth to take upon human flesh, and the angels are worshiping now on earth the one they were worshiping in heaven. I just, I don't know, to me that's just so cool, and to look at the song of the angels. Each of those songs, again, they're given a different context. They've been given uh, as songs that, that have been sung, and it gives us a really a pretty good picture of what happened 2,000 years ago. And this last song, this last um, cry of worship, call of praise, is through another man. Uh, his man. This man's name is Simeon, and it really puts the capstone on uh, this Christmas story. So go ahead and open your Bibles or Bible apps with me this morning one more time to the Gospel of Luke. Now last week as we, we talked about the song of the angels, we also read the account of the actual birth of Jesus. And so we read, uh, up to, we read what led up to the angels rejoicing and singing uh, there throughout the firmament, throughout the heavens, throughout the sky. Um, so we're not going to be looking anymore at prophecy. We're not looking anymore at what is going to come with the birth of Jesus. That's already happened. So when we read this song of Simeon, this is looking back at his reaction to the incarnation of Jesus because Jesus has already come. And we're going to find his story in Luke chapter 25, uh, or Luke chapter 2, verses 25 through 35. But just as we've done before, I want us to go back and read the context of why this individual is singing. What is it that's happening in his life? What is it that happened uh, in his specific context to cause him to call out to God in such a, an amazing and a powerful fashion? And so we're going to look at, at what it is that prompted the song of Simeon, and then we'll look at the song itself, and then talk about the applications, uh, I think, that are going to be pretty clear uh, for our lives today. I'm really, this is just, I love this. We actually dealt with this song a little bit last year, looking at Simeon and Anna uh, during one of our messages during Christmas, uh, but we're looking at it from a little bit of a different perspective today. And so I think you're going to uh, hopefully come away very encouraged uh, about what God is doing in our midst. Uh, look at verses uh, 21 through 24 with me, if you will. And remember, we just read about the birth of Jesus, the declaration of angels to the shepherds. The shepherds have already found the baby Jesus, and their reaction to that is the Bible says that they went and they were telling everyone what they had seen. They were excited about the truth that had been revealed to him, the truth that the Messiah has been born. And what we're reading here would have taken place just a few days after those events. So there's not much time has transpired since the, that song of the angels. Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 21. The Bible says, And when eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child, so eight days after the birth of Jesus is the time frame we're dealing with here, the Bible says that his name was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And so we see already one a step of obedience. So they're doing that which the angel has said. They're following through with that. And then in verse 22, it says, Now when the days of her purification, according to the laws of Moses, were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to pre present him to the Lord. Now they're bringing him to the temple, and they are, are bringing him uh, as part of the Old Testament law. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. Verse 23, it says, As it was written in the law of the Lord, every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, or dedicated, set apart to God. Okay, so for the Jewish people, they were to, kind of like what we do with a baby dedication, they are to give back this child to the Lord in a, in a symbolic sense, saying, God, you have blessed us with this child, uh, you have entrusted his care in, into our arms, and we are giving him back to you, okay? We are, um, we are dedicating him back to you. Verse 24. It says, and then they are to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. All right, so let's break down what it is that is happening so we can see what it is that Simeon is going to be singing about. We've got Mary, we've got Joseph. Again, we've got obedience to the Old Testament law, the commandment of God concerning Jewish male children. Uh, you can read the specifics about that if you want to go back and, and see what the law said about the dedication of this child. You can look at that in, in Genesis chapter 17. Uh, verse 12 is specifically going to deal with that. You've got a little more context as well. You can see that in the book of Leviticus also, Leviticus chapter 12, uh, verses 2 and 3. And so you're going to find what it is that God said about the dedication of a male child back to, back to God. Um, and what we're told is that on the eighth day that the parents are to circumcise any uh, male child that is born to them, uh, in addition to the circumcision, there's also a purification ceremony. Uh, both of those ceremonies are serving as reminders 
that we are all born into sin. And I think this is really important to realize that if you go back to the Old Testament law, these things are pointing to the fact that we are sinful, okay? We cannot save ourselves. There has been a promise all the way back from Genesis chapter 3 that there is going to be a Messiah who comes, and he is going to take care of this issue of sin, but you must trust in that revelation of God. You must trust in what God has revealed and what God is doing and in what God is going to do through the Messiah for, okay, for taking care of our sin. And so this is a reflection upon our own sinfulness, but also upon the goodness of God. So when you're looking at the purification, just think of it as, as being, as the Bible says, being washed clean, being washed white, our sins being removed as far as the east is from the west, uh, that, are, that we shall be made white as snow. That's that type of, of symbolism that you've got, even in the dedication of a child, back to the Lord. And so there is a lot of symbolism, there's a lot of significance that go uh, into these Old Testament practices. Um, but again, that's not what we're really focusing on this morning. Uh, but just understand uh, that God didn't just say to do something randomly. He didn't, he didn't just say, well, you're supposed to, to sacrifice these birds, and we'll talk about that as well. He didn't just say that you're supposed to go to the temple, well, just because it'd be a good thing to do. All right? This was a foreshadowing. This is a picture of the Messiah. This is done very purposefully, and that's the way that God works. God just doesn't do things by accident. He doesn't just do things randomly. He's like, ah, I think I'm going to do this today. No. From the very beginning, God had a plan for the redemption of mankind because he loved mankind. Now we look at it and say, how? Why? Why would God have such a love for, those of, for, for people, for those who are so sinful like we are? I can't explain the why, but I can say he did. Okay? So he did. He loved us enough to give us Jesus and so God tells us, he gives us these things that he expects us to follow through with. He intends for us to listen, and he intends for us to do that which he says in all areas, whether it's for the nation of Israel and the Old Testament laws. We talked about that a little bit in our discipleship uh, group this morning. Man, what an interesting, uh, interesting look at the book of Deuteronomy and how it applies to life today, how it, how it uh, reflects the Ten Commandments, um, how it is structured um, for our benefit um, and so when God speaks, we're supposed to listen. We're supposed to follow through with what he uh, has said uh, to do. So that's just a side note. Um, anyway, so Mary, Joseph, they bring uh, Jesus from Bethlehem, where he was born to Jerusalem, where the temple is. Uh, it's really not that far. We're dealing with about five and a half, six miles. And so it's not that, lar that great of a distance at this point in time. And they're following, again, God's commands to have him circumcised, to call his name Jesus, just as the angel Gabriel had instructed them to do. And in addition to that, again, they're dedicating Jesus back to the Lord, which if you stop to think about it, that's pretty cool, because where did he just come from? From the Father himself. <laughs> and so they're just turning right back around and saying, God, we're giving you back your son who just came from heaven not too terribly long ago. And so God is, is being glorified in that, in the actions of, of these two people who have been entrusted for the nurture and care of a newborn. Okay, Jesus was a newborn. Mary and Joseph had the same type of responsibilities and duties that you would have when, when you have a, a child that's born, okay? To feed him, to take care of him, to provide shelter, safety for him. And so they are dedicating him back to the Lord. God the Father, who had sent Jesus uh, in the flesh, um, is now um, receiving back his son in a symbolic and a figurative way. And the whole time that this process is going on, though, did you notice it's not really about Mary, it's not really about Joseph. It's about the child, it's about dedication to God, it's about following God's commands. They weren't elevating and exalting themselves, coming to the temple, uh, I mean, all puffed up and saying, hey, we've got the Messiah. People really didn't even know that they were there. Okay, this was very humble. Okay, everything about the birth, as we talked about last week, is, is, is founded in humility. And so this is uh, just one more thing that is showing that the focus is not upon them, the focus is on uh, their God, the focal point of the one who's being worshipped, as it should be. All right, again, I think that's very practical for us. What is the focal point even just of our, the entirety of our life? The focal point should be the Lord Jesus Christ. He wants to use us. He loves us. Okay, we are the vessel. We are the, 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 that which God is going to work through okay, to accomplish his purposes here on this earth. But it is ultimately him that we need to reflect the goodness back to. Uh, and so that's incredibly, incredibly important. Um, we're told that Mary and Joseph, as they come to the temple, that they offer up two birds uh, as part of the purification and the dedication ceremony. 
And yet, if you go back to Leviticus chapter 12, where we see uh, this being prescribed, we see that at this command, the birth of a son, that is to be a lamb to be offered up during the ceremony. Right? There's a provision that is made for families who do not have, uh, have the material means to provide a lamb, whether that be the finances or they don't, they're not shepherds, they don't have uh, physical lambs themselves. And so the Bible gives, uh, gives a substitute, that being one of these uh, two birds. And so in this, again, we see the humility of Mary and Joseph. We see that they are not of a high status. They're not wealthy. Um, they're just an average person. In fact, they probably would consider them poor, that they were impoverished. And so that is what Jesus was born into. Mary and Joseph having very little material things, yet in faith and trust in God, they're rich. Okay? You see the difference? They have to take this offering that was the substitute for the normal offering. They had to come and offer birds an offering, and yet they still did it. They are entrusted with the care of the Messiah, and yet they trusted God enough to come into the temple and say, hey, we don't even have a lamb to provide, but we want to follow God's ordinance. We want to honor God in everything that we're doing. Wow, what a great example. It doesn't matter what we have. It matters what's in the heart, and it matters what I'm giving back to God, what's happening inside of me. Right? Am I giving back to the Lord? Am I giving myself? Am I dedicating myself to that which God would desire uh, in me? And so this is, is what is happening. The dedication of the Lord in the temple, um, they're giving uh, back to God, Jesus himself. Normally it would be a lamb, but again, there's one more cool thing there. There really is a lamb. In there. Right there in the temple, there is a lamb. The Bible describes Jesus as the lamb of God who was slain before the foundation of the world. And so as Jesus is being dedicated back to the Lord, that lamb is him himself. The symbolism is being completed in the Messiah right before the eyes of those who are there in the temple. And so that's a whole other message we could get into, talking about who Jesus is, uh, the symbolism of the lamb, looking forward uh, to the Messiah. Okay? But he is the lamb of God. And so it is there in the temple where this purification, okay, where this ritual of dedication is, is taking place, that we read uh, the text of our main uh, passage today. So let's look at what it is that happens in this context of the dedication and the purification uh, concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 25, and we're going to be introduced to this man named Simeon. The Bible says, starting in verse 25, Behold, there is a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people to Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign which will be spoken against. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. This last song, this song of Simeon, the last song of our series, is an amazing song of hope. It is also a song that brought hope not just to one group of people, but to all people, hope to the Jews. Simeon was a Jew, but not only to them, it still brings hope to the Gentiles, to all people. So let's look at what's happening here. Mary and Joseph... Again, they've gone to the temple, dedicate baby Jesus unto the Lord, fulfillment of the law. While at the temple, they meet this man, Simeon, and we're told that Simeon was just and devout. Just and devout. It says that he was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. So we, we're not going to usually use that terminology to describe a Christian today, to describe an individual. Um, so let me kind of just repackage that uh, in, in, in maybe words that we would use today. So we would say that Simeon is a man who is faithful to God, Okay, being just and devout, devout being dedicated. So he is faithful to God. He is yielded to the Holy Spirit of God. 
right? And so the Bible says that, uh, that he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. The Holy Spirit was upon him. Okay, so he is yielded to the Spirit of God. He is anticipating the coming of the promised Messiah. He is anticipating the coming of Jesus, and he had been anticipating that for basically the majority of his life. And so he had trusted in the prophecies of the Old Testament. He had trusted in uh, the foretelling that the Messiah is going to come, and he is looking forward to that. Um, in fact, the Holy Spirit had even revealed to Simeon that before he died, he would physically see the Messiah himself. He would see the promised Messiah, the Christ. That's pretty cool. And so God had revealed to Simeon this truth. Now, remember that 400 years of silence? Okay? Simeon was still hanging on close to God, and when he receives this revelation from God, this would have been something so special to cling to, saying, really, God, you are going to give that to me? You're going to bless me in that way to allow me to see the Messiah? Yes, Simeon, I'm going to do that. You have been faithful. I love you. I care about you. You have been awaiting this time. There is a purpose for your, for your being here in this temple today. There is something that I want every generation after you to hear, and I want them to hear your song. I want them to hear your message. I want them to hear your proclamation of why Jesus has come. Because in the Song of Simeon, we see the whole purpose for why Jesus came to this earth. He came so that he could give life, so that he could bring salvation, not just to the Jew, but Simeon said to the Gentiles as well, to all nations. This casts us all the way back to what Jesus is going to speak about concerning the Great Commission, to call out his followers, those who would place their faith in him, to now go and to take his message to all peoples. And Simeon is proclaiming and announcing that on the eighth day of Jesus' earthly life. Wow, what an amazing, an amazing truth and an amazing song. So Simeon has been gifted a wonderful, wonderful gift. And his response is he breaks out in worship and praise. I mean, who wouldn't? You're holding the Son of God in your arms. You're holding the Messiah. I can't, I, I think about that and it's like, what, what would that even be like? I, I don't know. I just know, there's no telling what that would be like. What would we do? I don't know. Would we sing like Simeon? Would we be silent? I don't know. But what an amazing gift given to this man. You know, I can't help but wonder what emotions Simeon felt. What was really going on inside of him. What he thought that day as he held the Son of God in his arms. And thankfully, though, when you read this song, he does give us some insights into that. He gives us some insights into what he really is feeling and what he's thinking and what he's experiencing so we can relate just a little bit better to maybe how we would respond right, if we came into direct contact with Jesus, the physical Messiah. When the Bible tells us in verse 28 that Simeon blessed God, we see the nature of what he's about to say. That term is the same term that was used for Zacharias when he was once again able to speak. Remember when we looked at his song that the angel says, you didn't believe the words that I was telling you. And the consequences of that is you're not going to be able to speak until the birth of your son. And when he was able to speak again, the Bible says that Zacharias spoke blessing God. That's Luke 1, That was from our second song that we looked at. And in both places, the Greek word that is used here for this blessing of God is you, uh, you okay, Scott's going to kill me. Okay, I'm going to butcher this word. Um, I shouldn't, okay, you log it, okay? The Scots is like, no, that's not even, okay, all right. You log it, okay? It literally means a good word, all right? And the application being a word of praise, a word of worship, a word of exaltation, okay, of uplifting. Um, if that word, I know I'm butchering it, you log it, if it sounds familiar, it's because that's where we get the word that we would have at a funeral, a graveside service, it's called eulogy. Okay, so when somebody gets up and speaks on behalf of someone else, we call that a eulogy. All right, that's normally in our context at the death of somebody. This is at the birth of Jesus. But it is saying a good word on behalf of that individual. Okay, that's what we're doing with a eulogy. Okay, you never get up at a funeral and, just, and have somebody speak down upon the person who just died, right? I've never heard that. I guess maybe it's happened. That would be horrible. All right? But you ask somebody to give a eulogy, they're going to speak something positive, something good about that individual, something that impacted them. 
And so what Simeon is doing, what Zacharias was doing, they're speaking a good word of the Lord. They're speaking a good word of God and what he is doing uh, in their midst. And so what Simeon is going to say about Jesus is a blessing, is, God, this is, this is amazing. God, I want to speak of your goodness. I want to speak of your grace to me. I want to speak of how magnificent you are. I want to speak of my thankfulness to you for answering my prayer that came uh, through Jesus, that the answer comes through Jesus the Messiah. And so uh, in this moment, Simeon is seeing the promise come to fulfillment, the promise of the Holy Spirit of God. Um, and, and this uh, moment, as he's holding Jesus in his arms, he realizes everything that God had said would come to pass is coming to pass. Okay? He knows, he sees that God is faithful to his word, and he is experiencing it. He is uplifted, and his whole response is, that's all I needed. I can die in peace because I know God is faithful. He has blessed me. He has loved me. He has given me the greatest gift that I could ever ask for. He has given me the ability to see the baby Jesus. That phrase in and of itself, that, G, that, um, that he gives this good word, that he speaks the blessing. Uh, it's kind of interesting because each of the songs that we have, have read had a Latin name that was given to them. It's usually found in your Latin Vulgate, and so if, if those who are reading the text in Latin, they always have that title above it. This one's not any different. This one I didn't realize until I was studying through. It's like, wow, okay, this one too has a Latin name that was given to it that's still sometimes done in liturgical settings. Reflections of these songs of worship. Uh, the Latin name for this one is Nunc Dimittis. It's taken from the first two words of Simeon's song uh, from the Latin side, meaning now dismiss. Okay, I'm free to die. Okay, Nunc Dimittis. Okay, it's been finished. That's all I need. Okay, and that is the song that he sings. I am free to die. I am free to go on to, to my heavenly reward because of what God has done. Because the salvation of the Lord, I have seen it with my very eyes. I know, God, that you're going to do everything that you promised. And it's not just for me. It's for the Jewish people, and it's for everyone. It is for all of the Gentiles. Pretty amazing. Okay, that's what you see in verse number 30. Simeon is in absolute awe. That's all I need. God, you are an amazing God. In fact, the words that Simeon's going to speak, all right, he's in awe, but the words that Simeon is going to speak cause Mary and Joseph to be in awe, according to verse 33. Okay? And that's saying a lot because they knew who Jesus was, right? They weren't surprised that this is the one who was given the salvation of the Lord to the rise and fall of many in the nation of Israel, that all people would uh, be able to experience this salvation, both Jew and Gentile. They knew this. This is a revelation that is being given, okay, but it is something that at least they knew it to a certain extent, and yet when they hear it coming out of the mouth of another individual who God had revealed that truth to, the Bible says that they, too, stood in awe of those words. And so to see Jesus recognized in this way as the Savior of the world, still being a baby, was an amazing thing for them to behold. And it's in this that we see the first lesson from this song of Simeon. When we see Jesus for who he really is, the Savior of the world, okay, we are changed. It changes us. Okay? When we see Jesus, and I think I left out a word, when see, yeah. When we see Jesus for who he really is, the Savior of the world, it changes us. At least it should. Okay? When we behold him, as he really is, as revealed through Scripture, it causes something in us. The understanding that God himself would take upon flesh so that one day he could die for me, that is a pretty amazing thought. What do I do with that? What do I do with that? It's what we celebrate during Christmas. At least it's what we should celebrate during this time. It's my hope, my desire for each of you, for me, for anyone watching at home, is that you would be in awe of Christ. That you would see Jesus, this gift of God the Father, in such a way that it causes you, too, to be speechless. That you reflect upon the gift that is given, your own salvation, that has come through the Messiah. And that thought, the thought of Jesus being the Messiah, the Savior of the world, it leads us directly to the most important part of Simeon's song that we read in verses 31-32. 
Why are those two verses so important? Because they speak about how this baby Jesus did not just come for the Jewish people, his people. He also came to save the Gentiles. Now, the nation of Israel looking forward to the Messiah, they were claiming him. Okay, he was theirs. He was of their people. He was their tribe. He was, he was for the nation of Israel. So your average Jewish person, they weren't thinking at all about a Gentile or a Samaritan. Right? They're thinking that he has come for us. But Simeon, being a Jew, reveals that that was not the case. Okay, he understood that Jesus, that that baby that he held in his arms was not just for him and his people. Jesus was and is for all people. That's why we send out missionaries. That's why we support missionaries. That's why we pray for missionaries. That's why we care about our missionaries. Because Jesus has come for all. That's why we take up a special offering come time for Christmas. Because Jesus didn't just come for you who have already placed faith and trust in him. He has come for all of those who have not yet placed their faith and trust in him. It is a free gift offered to everyone, regardless of social status, regardless of ethnicity, regardless of where they live in this world, regardless of, of their background. Jesus has come for all people, and that is the message that must go out into all the world. Simeon knew it, Jesus knew it, the disciples knew it, the apostles knew it. That's what the entirety of the New Testament is about. The message going forth that Jesus has come. That's why we celebrate Christmas. Because he has come for all people. And that's the second lesson that we've absolutely got to get today. Jesus is for all people and his message must go out to all the world. Simeon said, it's not my job to now go take the message. It's my job to proclaim that that message is available for, for all. And all who will follow Jesus, they are the ones to now proclaim that message. Simeon was at the end of his life. Okay? But he did what it is that God had asked him to do, to be faithful. And God rewarded that faithfulness. We are the recipients of the blessing of Simeon. We are the recipients of the call of Jesus. We are the recipients of the, of the background that, and the hard work that had gone on before of the disciples and the apostles and all those early Christians who suffered persecution, who suffered so many things so that one day we too could take this message to all people, to the ends of the earth. Okay? Jesus is for all. Most of the world today isn't Jewish. You realize that? If you look at the statistics, about 0.2% of the world's population today is considered to be Jewish by ethnicity. And I don't know about you, but I'm glad then that Jesus came for all. I mean, we would be eliminating 99.8% of the world if Jesus was only for the Jew. Right? But he wasn't. He is for all people. But you know, Simeon says this, but for, I mean, decades on into the future, that is going to be a hard truth to accept, even by those who walked closest to Jesus. Do you remember what happens in Acts chapter 10 with Peter? Okay. Peter is called to go to a Gentile, and he's wrestling with this. He's like, oh, that doesn't feel right. Jesus is for me. He's for the Jew. And you're telling me, I'm, God, you're telling me I'm supposed to go to the Gentiles? Absolutely. And Peter who walked with the Lord, who was by his side for three years, who heard him teaching day in and day out, who saw him ascend back into heaven, he's still wrestling with this thought that Jesus is for everyone. And so it was a hard thing to accept. It makes it all that much more amazing that somebody would accept that truth even before Jesus spoke his first word. Simeon knew he'd been gifted by God. As we talked about over the last three weeks, all of the previous songs, they bring hope to the Jew. Right? They bring hope to the Jewish nation who had been waiting, anticipating the Messiah. This is their fulfillment. Okay? But Simeon takes it further. He follows the lead of Isaiah who prophesied that the Messiah would come for all. And Simeon understood that God included us, you and me. I think most of us here are Gentiles. I don't know, maybe some, some of you here, maybe someone uh, is Jewish. I don't know. But he's come for us. He has come for us, for humanity. So during this time of giving and thankfulness and worship and praise, let's not forget to share this good news of Jesus with all people, right? with all those for whom Jesus died. And then at the end of Simeon's song of praise, the Bible says that he blessed them. The them is Mary and Joseph, as well as, as Jesus. He spoke these words to Mary, 
It's the same word that he's using. He's speaking good words to her, but they're hard words. They are words that are going to be good for the world, but hard for Mary. All right? Look back at those two verses. Simeon tells Mary, I can imagine he's probably looking her in the eyes. He says, behold, this child, signifying Jesus, pointing to Jesus, maybe placing his hand upon him. This child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel, for a sign which will be spoken against. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. The fall and rising of many. This is going to be shown in the way that Peter repented, finding blessing and hope in Jesus. But Judas betrayed him, finding only darkness and despair. The rise and fall, it's shown on the thief on the cross. The one who beside Jesus blasphemed him, while the other thief believed, finding salvation. You see, Jesus is like a magnet that attracts some to those who are searching for hope and searching for help and searching for the answer. But to others, they are repelled from him. The rise and fall. It's in the hands of God and it's in the hands of the individual. Simeon said, it's not up to you. This is simply what, the way it's going to be. Some will rise to him, others will reject him. Just the way it is. Simeon knew it. Mary and Joseph received it. Even God the Father knew it. And yet, Jesus still offers this greatest gift of all, the gift that we celebrate at Christmas. He offers it to everyone, knowing that many will reject it. And it's sad. You think about that. You say, how would you reject a free gift? How would you reject something that changes your life here and now, changes your future, and changes your eternity, all for the better, why would somebody reject that? Sin. Sin deludes. Sin causes us to run after that which doesn't matter in life while we reject the thing that is the absolute most important. It's our own sinfulness that blinds us from the truth of Jesus. And unfortunately, so many people today are blinded by the truth. That's why the words of Simeon to go and to tell that this is for the salvation of all people is so important. Because we are called to make a difference in this world. We are called to share this gift of salvation with everyone. And yet some will still reject. It's hard. I can't imagine to be the actual recipients of those words. To be Mary and Joseph, specifically being Mary. In verse 35, it's talking about this sword that is going to pierce even to her soul. What's he referencing? He's referencing the death of Jesus. There's going to come a day that Mary is going to have to see her very son being tortured, spit upon, beaten, even unrecognizable. She's going to witness that. Can you imagine, those of you guys that are parents, can you imagine a child being tortured and beaten to where you look at your child and you can't even tell that it's them? Man, a sword being pierced through her soul. But that was a good word, right? That was a good word for the world. And a hard word for Mary. Have you accepted that gift? Have you accepted this gift of salvation that comes through trial and adversity and the greatest pain and heartache that a person could ever go through? And yet, for us, it is magnificent. And it is glorious. And it is life-changing. Have you accepted that gift? Jesus knew the pain that it would cause when you read through the account right prior to Jesus' arrest and crucifixion, he knew. He knew the pain it was going to cause him. He knew the pain it would cause his mother, those who would follow after him. And yet he endured that suffering. He endured that pain so that something so much greater could be accomplished. The gift of salvation. Because ultimately that's what we celebrate at Christmas. It doesn't do any good for Jesus to come to this earth and to be born in humble beginnings and to take upon flesh if he were to just die and nothing happens. No. He came so that he would die as a substitute in our place, taking the punishment that we deserve so that we could have a relationship with God the Father. Guys, what an amazing truth this is. What an amazing thing to celebrate at Christmas. It's not just the birth. It's also the life, the message. And it's about his substitutionary death and subsequent resurrection. Jesus came so that we would have life and then we would go and share that life with all people. Let's pray. 
Our Heavenly Father, God, I'm thankful, Lord, that we have this time that has been set aside. December the 25th, Lord, really it's become almost the entirety of, of December. It's just kind of a, a theme. But much of what's happening throughout this time that we call Christmas is so culturally um, removed from what really this is all about. But I pray that maybe this morning, God, you've helped us to bring our thoughts and our minds back to why we really have this holiday to begin with. Lord, what it really means to worship and to serve you. God, you came so that we could have life. And God, for those that are here this morning, those that are watching, Lord, that have already placed their faith and trust in you, we are thankful, God, for this amazing gift. We're thankful that you have changed us. We're thankful for the blessings you bring into our lives. We're thankful for a changed eternity. But Lord, we also understand that it's our responsibility and, and our privilege to be able to share this love with those who do not yet know or understand this message. God, I pray for those that are here today, Lord, and they're still wrestling with a complete understanding of what it means to trust in you, of what it really means to be a Christian, of what it means to be dedicated to your will and your way far and above anything that we would put in its place. God, I pray for those who are hurting today, Lord, those who are, are just struggling. Lord, I think of Miss Dorothy and, Lord, going through this time for the first time in, in, in her life since she had met Roy, that she is without him. But, Lord, we understand that you are called the Prince of Peace. Lord, you bring peace to the brokenhearted. You bring peace to the ones who are, are weary and tired. You bring peace to those who are struggling and wrestling with sin. And, God, you do that because that's who you are. And, Lord, we're thankful Lord, that in you we find the fulfillment of all of our needs if we will just yield ourselves completely to you to the best that we can. Lord, as we yield ourselves to you, you reveal more and more of your truth and of your word and of who you are and your spirit leads. God, I pray today for those that are still wrestling and struggling with fully dedicating themselves to you. Lord, that in their heart, that this stirring, that the decision would be made today, God, to say, all right, enough. I'm going to trust you. As we get ready to turn a calendar year, Lord, help us to be focused. Lord, sometimes it's a time of renewal. It's a time of a fresh start. Lord, we're thankful for that opportunity as well. God, we are thankful to worship you today. We're thankful for the gift of Jesus. And we pray, God, that we would reflect him well to those who need to see him. We pray these things in Jesus' name.